Good evening, good evening, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the next installment of the South Florida Social Justice Common Read. I am one of your hosts, Dr. Tamika Hobbs. I am the founding director of the Social Justice Institute at Florida Memorial University, and I am so glad to be with you this evening. Uh, we have a very special conversation lined up for you tonight. Uh, tonight's guest of honor is none under other than Candace Taylor. She is the author of a book called The Overground Railroad, which is the first historical book to take a look at the legacy of the Green Book. The Green Book has been the subject of a great deal of interest in the past few years. There's been a movie even that's come out uh, where Hollywood has taken up the theme of, of the Green Book. But tonight, we have the woman who has penned the very first and quite authoritative story of the production, the history, and the impact and the legacy of that green book. Tonight, we'll explore themes that deal with black leisure, black travel, black freedom, black business, and think about all of the things that have to do uh, with that. Uh, it is at, at once a quite beautiful story, when we think about this uh, creativity that African Americans exercised as they faced Jim Crow and systemic racism during decades previous. But I think you'll also find in this book that there is a tremendous story of, of loss that uh, calls for some serious reflection on the state of Black America and specifically the state of the Black economy. So really glad to be a part of this tonight. I'm so glad to have with me uh, my partners in this effort with the South Florida Social Justice Common Read as we really try to do the work of improving our society. And the only way to do that is if we come together, if we study together, if we interrogate the past together to understand how we get got here. And only when we do that work can we begin to forecast and imagine a different future. So that's what it's all about. Because we're virtual due to the pandemic, it doesn't matter where you are, if you're in South Florida or around the country, uh, it doesn't matter your age, it doesn't matter your politics, it gives us a way to uh, come into the space together and have a shared intellectual experience. So that's really the genesis and the, and the hope of the South Florida Social Justice Common Read. So we really want to thank Thank you for being here this evening. We want to thank our sponsors. Tonight's installment was funded in part by the Florida Humanities. We want to definitely appreciate them for their investment in this vision and um, really thank them for their contribution. I'll bring bringing in my other co-sponsors uh, momentarily. But as we get started, I just want to invite you, whether you are watching on YouTube or you're watching the Facebook stream, please take a moment and reshare the post. Uh, let people know about the conversation that we're having now and invite them in so that we can continue the conversation. So I'd like to bring up my main co-sponsor co and that is going to be Makiba Foster, who is the managing director of the African-American Research Library and Cultural Center in Fort Lauderdale that's a part of Broward Public Libraries. Good evening, Makiba. How are you? Hello. How are you? Good to see um, you. Good to Happy see you. To be back. Yeah. Happy to be back in the place. Um, we at the African American Research Library and Cultural Center, which is a Broward County library, we're always happy to be able to figure out ways to bridge uh, academia and this kind of academic scholarship to um, the everyday um, citizen who wants to better understand their world. And we think that this particular book is one of those things that um, puts us in present day conversation with the past. And we're just really excited to um, be a part of this conversation. And also um, just a, a little bit in terms of, uh, of how it's uh, a part of our South Florida Book Festival. So I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. But yeah, to me, it's always a pleasure to be here with you and my other fellow sister in the struggle. You forgot to say that to me, but you know. Oh yeah, that's right. That is our moniker. It's been too long. That's been a few months. Um, you also happen to be a board member with the Florida Humanities, correct? Yes. And so um, I'm wearing a lot of hats tonight. So um, on behalf of the Florida Humanities, I just want to let the folks out there know that the work that we do and the mission 
uh, of Florida Humanities is to preserve, promote, and share the history, literature, culture, and personal stories that offer Floridians a better understanding of themselves, their communities, and their state. And certainly tonight we'll understand a little bit more about the Green Book in the state of Florida. Um, Florida Humanities works with local humanities organizations to accomplish its missions, and this includes libraries, museums, historical societies, among uh, others. And so um, local humanities organizations are committed to uh, their communities and committed to sharing the diverse range of stories, ideas, and experiences. And so Florida Humanities is very proud to support the work of South Florida Social Justice Common Read. So we're, um, as a board member of Florida Humanities, we're very happy to support this, this work. So I'll take my hat off. Um, no longer the Florida Humanities board member. I'm back. Get your little little yeah. hat rack over there to hang them all up as you as you change through them. But thank yes. you for that. Yes. And again, thank you to the Florida Humanities. Next up, I want to bring up our other sister in the struggle, my longtime good buddy, Ronnie Bennett, who is the executive director of the South Florida People of Color. Good evening, Ronnie. Good evening, my friend. How are you? I am well. I'm excited about tonight's conversation. So am I. And, uh, you know, I just want to say a little bit about South Florida People of Color. You know, we are a nonprofit and uh, are, we're committed to racial healing and dismantling racism in all its forms. And that's individual, institutional, systemic. And we do that through education and advocacy. So this is perfect uh, for us because, you know, our vision is to have that national conversation on race. And we believe that nothing will bridge that gap. And uh, what you need to have is communities come together with deep, authentic dialogue. And that's what's the first step of dismantling the system. So, so I'm so happy to be here and um, I'm looking forward to uh, listening to Ms. Taylor. Awesome, awesome. Um, would you go ahead and move us forward and do us the honor of introducing this evening's speaker? Absolutely, and I am like so excited. We have an award-winning author, photographer, cultural documentarian, Candace, Candace C. Taylor. And she is working on a multidisciplinary project based on the Green Book. Uh, Taylor is the author of The Overground Railroad, The Green Book and the Roots of uh, Black Travel in America, of course. And she is also the curator and content specialist for an exhibition that is touring now by the Smithsonian Institute Traveling Exhibition Services. And that kicked off uh, last year, I think in June, June of 2020. The exhibition will travel through, is traveling through the United States for three years. And I, I need to ask, I'm hoping it, Miami is on that list. So mm -hmm. Taylor was a uh, fellow at the Hutchison Center at Harvard University under the direction of Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. And her projects have been commissioned and funded by numerous organizations, including the Library of Congress, National Geographic, the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Endowment of the Humanities, the National Park Service, and the Schomburg Center of Research in Black Culture. Now, Taylor's work has been featured in over 50 media outlets, including The Atlantic, CBS Sunday News, The Guardian, the Guardian UK, the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, the New Yorker, Newsweek, PBS, NewsHour, and the Wall Street Journal. And Taylor lives in Harlem today. So, Ms. Taylor, I do have a question. I can ask a question, right, since I was able to introduce you. <laughs> I just want to say I, I, love, I love this book. I love the book. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having yeah. me. I'm so honored to be here, and it's just Lovely. I really appreciate all this, um, all your kind words so far. But yeah, I'm excited to be here and talk about this subject. Wonderful. So, you know, I will say what I loved about uh, is how you, how your research about navigating the country while black was more with more real stories, right, from your stepfather. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Ron, of course, you know, Ron grew up in the Jim Crow South. So I felt that his, ex you know, his experience helped give it more human face to the facts in this mm -hmm. time. So can you discuss your book's opening and with the memory of Ron's family getting stopped by the police while driving mm -hmm. his nice car and, and, and yes. some other things, he's throughout the book, so. Yes. So yeah, the story about, about Ron is really fascinating because it was a surprise to me as well. 
I originally, um, I started doing this work in 2013. I started documenting sites and that's when I first learned about the green book. And in a very short, I had known my stepfather, Ron, since I was about 12 years old. So I'd known him all my adult life, but it wasn't until I started this project that he started sharing stories about growing up in the Jim Crow South. He was a dark skinned, you know, large black man, um, growing up during Jim Crow in Tennessee. And it, when I, I believe he just started to trust me more when he saw that I was so engaged in this material. And he loved to talk because he's from the South. He could tell stories all day long, but I'd never heard these stories. And he started, he told me a story um, about uh, driving North. He had taken a trip with his family. Um, his parents were in the front seat. He was about seven years old. He was sitting in the back seat and they get pulled over by the sheriff. And his father turned and looked at him and said, do not say a word. And Ron didn't know what was happening. He thought maybe was he in trouble? He didn't understand what was going on. Um, and so when the sheriff came to the to the window, you know, he said, whose car is this? And who, who are these people with you? And where are you going? And uh, Ron's father said, you know, this is my employer's car. And he turned and looked at his wife and pretended he didn't know her and said, you know, she's the maid and that's her son and I'm driving them home. And the sheriff said, well, where's your hat? And he said, oh, it's hanging right in the back officer. And there had always been a chauffeur's hat hanging on the, in the back seat that no one ever used. Ron never knew what it was for until that day. And because Ron's father had a nicer car, um, that was the story that black men told um, as kind of a prop or a ruse to really show, um, to get out of, any potential problems with law enforcement. So when Ron tells me this story, you know, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I've known you all my life. And I've never, I was reading about stories about the chauffeur's hat during my research. And I said, you know, is this true? And then he tells me the story. So it was fascinating because when I sat down to start writing the book, Ron died about the week before I started to write the book. And I was devastated. And I remember calling my agent and I would just get up every morning and type as the sun was coming up. And I would just type his stories because when I was on the road, he was, we would talk on the phone a lot. And so I was in the car for, I was working 16 hour days. I was in the car all the time. So we would just talk about stuff. And so I just started writing those stories. I was like, I don't want to forget them. And I told my agent, you know, um, basically I, know that I have to open up the book with Ron in the backseat of the car with the chauffeur's hat. And, but I think there's a narrative thread here where he's, there's touchstones in every chapter of the book. Um, and she just said, keep going. So yeah, that's how he becomes this narrative thread. But had he not passed, I don't think I would have done it that way. He was kind of a, he liked being the center of attention. So I'm sure he loves that, you know, he's, humanized he's the reason he's part of the reason why this book is been received so well because it, you're right it humanizes this history um yes. but had he not passed i don't think i would have um featured him so prominently wow okay Wonderful. well thank you for that i i i really love the stories about ron um condolences to you on your loss but you definitely um gave a tribute to his spirit he he lives in this book it's a it's a beautiful tribute to him so you definitely should be should be proud of it thank you yeah, yeah. I, I, I certainly agree in terms of the, kind of the idea of like the narrative so you talk about the Overground Railroad, but the narrative that you you weave is almost like the tracks in which you tell the story. So not even just with Ron, with um, learning more about um, Alma and Victor from their nieces was just mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. So you've done a, a kudos to you. Thank you for this work. Yes. Give you your yes. flowers now. And also <laughs> even your story of being on the road and how it, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. Um, so I guess one of the things that we probably should actually, because we are we're in the know, but I don't want to assume that that folks know, you know, what the Green Books what it is. Um, mm -hmm. We have the we have the movie. We won't talk about the movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but tell us about the Green Book. Um, 
Victor and Alma Green. Um, tell it, just give us a, a crash course in the history of, of the Green Book, please. Sure. Well, the Green Book was a travel guide. It was published for Black people during the Jim Crow era. The first edition actually was published in 1936 um, by a man named Victor Hugo Green. And Alma Green was his wife. And I believe she was a major factor in the success and longevity of the Green Book. Um, but Victor was a postal worker from Harlem. He was really solving his own problem. He, um, the, there was a riot um, in 1935, a race riot in Harlem, uh, essentially because black folks, even though we see the 1920s era and 30s as this, you know, Harlem being this black Mecca um, for creativity and culture, it was still very highly segregated. And there were still most places on 125th Street where black folks were only allowed in certain parts of the theater, or they weren't allowed in certain stores. And so Victor um, was oftentimes driving his wife, Alma, to uh, Virginia, uh, back to where her hometown. And he had to deal with some things, you know, and traveling and being black. And um, and he had a Jewish friend who had a, who would go to the Borscht Belt very frequently and had a kosher guide. Mm -hmm. And we think that was one of the, kind of light bulb moments for Mr. Green who said, you know, wow, we could use something like that. Uh, so that's how it started. And it was in publication through 1967. So there were, but you know, the thing about the Green Book is that it wasn't the only one. There were about a dozen other black travel guides. Mm -hmm. So, and there was one before the Green Book. It was in 1930 called Hackley and Harrison's and it was only in publication for a year. But um, but the thing that makes a Green Book so special is that it was in publication the longest out of all of those other guides. It had the broadest reach, um, and it was it was just the most um, it was used by the most people. By 1962, there were about two million people using the Green Book. So, you know, it's just it's iconic. It's an incredible brand that he built, um, and I think he was kind of the Steve Jobs of his time. <laughs> Wow. wow, it's wonderful. So, yeah, that that's an interesting. The Steve Jobs of his time, doesn't because I think I think in the, you know I say Steve Jobs because I'm sure when Steve Jobs put a camera in a phone, hmm. you know he had no intention of it being this civil rights wow. weapon, right? And that's exactly what the Green Book was. I mean, it literally put black folks into white spaces that they had been shut out of or finding different opportunities for freedom of travel. That symbolism about being on the road and being in a car and having, being able to go to beaches um, that, you know, Mo Robert Moses had built infrastructure so that people of color couldn't get to the beaches. But if you had a car and you had a green book, you could see you could go to Jones Beach. So, I mean, he was, it was a revolutionary tool. Yes, I think there's a lot to be said about uh, the democratization of leisure in America. That that too uh, is hard for many people to believe. Continues to be a battlefield. Has historically been a battlefield, especially when you're dealing with groups of people who have been prized for their labor. They're only seen as laborers. The idea of black, black people like relaxing and enjoying um, the American landscape is um, a really foreign concept. And I, I think that was a very prominent. Uh, theme for me as I was uh, reading your book, uh, Ms. Taylor. Uh, I'd like to pivot at this point and talk about what really was very powerful for me that you you brought up in your writing. And that is, is that yes, this is a travel guide, but it also is a black business guide, right? Mm -hmm. Because the places that black people could patronize were often run by African-Americans. And so there is this continuing thread of economic, uh, black economic pride and connection that also is built into the Green Book. You talk about nearly 10,000 businesses that were listed as a part of it. And the, the timing was also really interesting. As, as was mentioned, the first edition of the Green Book is going to be published in 1936. That is in the midst of the Great Depression. Um, and as people are dealing with unemployment, black people in especially major cities became keenly aware 
of the practice of racism that kept them uh, in an economically disadvantaged position. And that, of course, is the practices of some white owned businesses who would come into the black neighborhood to take money out, but were hesitant, resistant, or did not at all hire black people. So there were these campaigns that we know of in Harlem and Detroit and Chicago, campaigns led by black civil rights organizations and black citizens often organized and carried out by black women. We know that women have the power of the pocketbook uh, then and now uh, to some extent. And, and they basically said, don't shop where you can't work. If this cannot be a reciprocal relationship, we don't want any part of it, that you don't need to be in our communities. Um, and that was really a big part of, I believe, chapter two in your book. I wondered if you could really talk a little bit more for our viewers tonight about what you found, what you discovered in terms of this, this legacy of, of Black business as a part of the Green Book. Yes, um, it, you know, it's really critical, I think, and I love the way that when you frame it in such a, it's, because we're still actually having this discussion, right, today, mm -hmm. um, but especially during the time the Green Book was published, you know, it was really a black yellow pages, and the Green Book was so unique, people called it like a triple A guide for black folks, but it was really so much more because it had more than just your travel your typical travel sites, which would be lodging and food and, you know, maybe garages or um, nightclubs. But the Green Book had drugstores and haberdashers and uh, funeral homes and sanitariums and doctors. And there were so many different types of businesses, anything you could imagine, banks, you know, there were banks in the Green Book. Um, it was really a record of how many places black folks were shut out of and what resources they may need on the road that they had to list in the green book. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it was, you know, this win-win because if you could get to South Central Los Angeles, you could see, oh, there's beauty shops, there's barber shops, there's all these green book sites, anything you might need. And once you got there, it was like a safe haven. And these were clusters of um, a lot of black businesses they were segregated communities because redlining was a, was very effective um, in keeping people separate. So it really did operate as this tool for um, this kind of mecca of black liberation and black owned businesses and and pride and entrepreneurship and resilience and all of those things. Um, that we ended up losing. And so, yeah, in the beginning of the book, you know, it really does address that factor. But by chapter 11, you know, we look at integration being the double-edged sword um, because once we could integrate and once black people did leave those communities, then we lost um, the black dollar. We lost a lot of our power um, and independence. Um, so, and yet we gained integration you know, my stepfather Ron said integration was the worst thing that ever happened to us. But, um, and I understood, I never understood why he said that until I started doing this wow. project wow. and started seeing, you know, because when you look through the green books, you just see a list of just businesses. They don't really mean anything. Their names, some of them are interesting, whatever. But once I dug deeper and I cataloged over 10,000 sites and I went and found the ones that are still operating and I researched, you know, who own these places and how much they meant in the community. Um, it brought them to life in a, in a really powerful way. That is, I mean, and I, I, I reflect on the words of, of your stepfather, that it was the worst thing. And, and you know, I think I, I tend to be one who catalogs a lot of, of games. Um, there has been a lot of progress, um, the symbolic victory of Barack Obama and, and so many other things where we see uh, Black people, people of color thriving. Uh, in this society, but you crystallize in this book the tremendous loss uh, that came with integration, the loss of Black neighborhoods, and specifically, as you outline in your book, Overground Railroad, the loss of, of Black businesses. That was something that really uh, tugged at my, at my heart and my mind. There's been so, so much interest these days. I remember it most keenly in the moments after 
the uh, murder of Mike Brown. Um, it was around going into the Thanksgiving and holiday season. We all know that Black Friday is one of those really important shopping mm -hmm. holidays, but there was a, a concerted effort uh, for people to abstain from purchasing and buying and, and protest. And that had a real impact. Mm -hmm. uh, you go to 2020 and we've seen uh, last year, there was a real interest in black businesses. Everybody's kind of getting on that bag bandwagon and it's pointing us in the right direction. But I, as one of the reasons why I love history, though, is that it gives you a snapshot of, of who we are and, and where we are as opposed to where we were. And I think that this is one area of Black society where we really have lost. I think I would have to agree with, with your stepfather that this was uh, one of the areas where we have, have fallen back. Um, I want to I want to go into one of the questions from one of our viewers tonight. I wanna to thank her for being here. Uh, Jackie uh, Muzamel, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce your name. She wanted to hear from you, Candace, uh, to understand the title of your book, The Overground Railroad. I think many of us are familiar with the Underground Railroad, but mm -hmm. why did you settle on that title, The Overground Railroad? Yeah, I was um, actually, I was doing my fellowship at Harvard with skip gates and uh i was standing in the harvard yard with my fellows and we had been in a symposium talking about really how you know how we were talking about migration and um especially with the black migration and all of this quote unquote underground work that we're doing and i was reading a lot of and listening to a lot of um videos and uh, audio pieces from Michelle Alexander, who wrote The New Jim Crow. And she talked about this, you know, kind of bringing, especially the, the mass incarceration issue, bringing it up into the, you know, to the surface and having a groundswell of people who are helping to get folks who were formerly incarcerated back into civilian life um, because they've become so ostracized and um mm -hmm. and i was thinking you know that's essentially what the what the green book did it was like an overground railroad because black folks had been going in the underground railroad to just stay you know symbolically hidden um to survive and yet the green book was like no we are all here and we are out and we are driving and we are you know manifesting our own destiny um, and so I was in the yard, in the Harvard yard. I was like, it was like an overground railroad. And John Jennings, um, who was a, uh, he's an author as well. I don't know if you know his work, but you know, he pointed to me, he said, that's the title of your book. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I called my agent right there. I said, I think, you know, I got the title. And she was like, yes, let's, let's do it. So it's just, you know, it's symbolic, um, but also hopefully um, a, uh, a call to action to you know, bringing things to the surface and facing them and moving forward. So you, see, you talk about the 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 title Overground Railroad, and so you mentioned the Underground Railroad, and I want to talk a little bit about mobility. So we've talked about kind of like some economic mobility, but actual the geographic kind of mobility of being able to move about freely, I guess, or so somewhat freely. And so um, I wanted to, um, we think about the Underground Railroad, we think about people enslaved in the South moving North, right? Um, and a lot of, I think, the understanding, people who understand the Green Book is, is this idea of, of people, Black people in the North traveling South. And one of the things that I think that you do really interestingly in this book is that you actually talk about like the South being the boogeyman. It is, it, it has all the bad reputation for what it is because that is what the South sometimes represent. But a lot of times, I think you said that the North is let off the hook. And as I'm at talking to you and asking you this question, this is actually the week, and this is the sixth year anniversary of Sandra Bland's um, mm -hmm. mysterious death, um, a Northern woman um, mm -hmm. traveling to the South. But um, you talk about um, sundown towns and how they are located, were located a lot in the North. And so I just wanna uh, hear from you and so you can discuss uh, Green Books, the Green Books as a, like a site to, or an effort to navigate not only the South, but also the North. And, and that was surprising for you as you started to do this research. 
Right. Yes. The, you know, the way that I learned about the green book was I stumbled on it by accident because I was commissioned to write a book on route 66. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a travel guide and I'd never taken a commission like this. And I was wondering why, why, you know, why do I care about route six? Like what, how did I, I need the money. So that's why I did it. <laughs> and I was kind of kicking myself at the time. Cause I was like, this isn't even going to pay my, you know, it wasn't even enough money, but, um, <laughs> but I, it was, you know, meant to be because I was one of the only, and I arguably the only black woman to write a major travel guide on route 66. Cause 99% of all the books have been written by white men. And my first question was, when I learned about sundown towns, um, which were all white communities and they were all white on purpose. Um, and they were a phenomenon throughout the country. And they, some would have a sign saying inward, don't let the sun set on you here. Some would ring a bell at 6 PM telling folks, you know, the black laborers and domestics who were working in the town, that was their cue to leave. Um, so it was very serious. And when I learned that half the counties on Route 66 were sundown towns mm -hmm. and Route 66 travels from Chicago to LA, it's not in the deep South, the South, it goes into maybe the part of, um, you know, the, the panhandle of Texas, but the majority of those sites, those states are in the North and the West. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, then how do black people travel Route 66 if half the counties were sundown towns? Mm -hmm. And when I had that question, that's what led me to the Green Book. I found it at the Autry Museum in Los Angeles. Um, and there was one tucked under a corner and behind glass in a corner. And I never knew such a thing had existed. And I ran out and I called my parents and Ron had heard about it. My mom didn't know about the Green Book. Most people I talked to at the time in 2013 didn't know about the Green Book. So it was really alarming to me that because when I grew up in Houston, to, I lived in Houston, Texas when I was very young, and then I moved to Ohio, and I spent most of my life living in the North and the West. And I love the South, but it was it always got this you know bad reputation for being more racist or more dangerous. And I thought that is completely not true because when I looked at the research and I looked at um, the level of work it must have taken for people like. Mr. Moses, you know, who built infrastructure. I mean, there were so many covert operations that the North was using and mm -hmm. things like redlining and um, urban renewal and ways that, I mean, they moved concrete and tore down buildings to shape and control and corral black folks in the North. In the South, they had signs, right. but it was no, I mean, the, the links that the North went to were very extreme to keep black folks quote unquote in their place. And the, the consequences of you driving, if you were from the South and you were leaving, you were going North on a trip, even those who were traveling during the great migration, the second wave of the great migration was underway when the green book was at its most popular mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So you have one and a half million people during those decades, you know, um, with the green book, uh, there were nearly 7 million people who migrated, but during the height of the Green Book, there were at least a one and a half million black folks leaving the South, fleeing racial terror, going North. And they were shocked to find they may end up inadvertently or accidentally in a sundown town. Mm. And then, or they would be in a place where there was no sign saying where they could or couldn't be, yet there were prescribed rules about where black folks were allowed to be. And if you were not from mm. there, you wouldn't know and you were definitely more in more danger of finding yourself in the wrong place. So the thing about, you know, sundown towns too, is there, there were hundreds of sundown towns in the state of Illinois, and there were maybe less than five in the whole state of Mississippi. Mm. So again, I think it's a symbolism that, you know, as they, as symbols do, they take on this meaning sometimes without any real facts. Mm. Um, you can say that is, you know, the symbolism of our country of equality. <laughs> so, you right. know, that's what we tend to do really well here in America. And I think it was very clear to me that this was, um, I had, I did not know the truth. And so mm -hmm. when I wrote this, when I wrote this book, um, it was very eye opening. 
Well, that's a, that's an interesting compliment to, um, and, and part of the inspiration for us holding this South Florida Social Justice Common Read is to correct some of the assumptions that we make about America's history. Mm -hmm. There has been this uh, continuing theme, whether we're talking about the antebellum period or the uh, more recent decades that the North, the West was somehow less racist than the South. But what you're really speaking to Ms. Taylor is the fact, the documented evidence that you have found in your travel writings that this absolutely was not true and that it was quite a risky proposition for blacks to, to travel um, during previous decades. Uh, that, that's a really important point for us to illuminate as we try to educate people to help understand the, the true nature of, of life in America for Black people in previous decades. And while they have been some improvement now, it still is a very fraught experience um, traveling by car uh, in this country. Um, as per what Makiba mentioned about Sandra Bland, what we know about, I know nearly every Black male in my family has had some negative uh, experience with a law enforcement officer being pulled over for little to no reason. Um, and so those are still things, uh, legacies, unfortunately, that are very much with us. Um, Ronnie, I wanted to kick it to you because we have a question in the chat from Hester. I wondered if you would bring that one up for, for uh, Ken Daisy. Okay, let me, I probably need my glasses. Um, about the, about where you can get the book. Yes, I think it's on the screen now, yes. Um, okay, how, thank you. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so how or where uh, we can get copies, where they're sold? I'm assuming, Ms. Taylor, they're everywhere, right? So, oh, I, I think, think he's I'm, talking about the Green Book, right? Yeah. Not oh, are you talking about, oh, sorry. I'm just thinking yeah, about no, this. you can definitely buy my book. Anyway. <laughs> 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 Feel free. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good I'm question. My glasses. Um, the Green Book uh, oh, is. was, again, why it was so popular and what made, I think, Victor Green a genius um, is that he knew how to market this guide. And he was very oh. clever about how to actually get um, the, you know, you can see, and in, in my book, I talk about the growth of the Green Book as, as a document, because it really does change over time. Victor Green signs with different um, publishers that make it more dynamic, that have more photographs. And um, so it was a very handsome looking guide by the time, very soon after he started publishing it. Um, but what he did was he had, he, because he was a postal worker, he was part of the Postal Workers Union and postal workers unions were segregated, like, a, like most other things at that time. And so throughout the country, the black postal workers, their beat was in the black neighborhoods. So Victor Green gave them a green book or asked them to solicit for business, you know? And so when the green, when postal workers would go to Auburn Avenue or, you know, in Atlanta or whatever, they knew all the black business owners, they'd say, you know, you should probably advertise in this. It was free to advertise in the green book unless you wanted a big ad or you wanted a whole page or something, but just to have a listing, it was free. So it was a win-win again to build this entrepreneurship and um, help uh, black businesses. So that was one way. The other way that Victor Green was a master in marketing was that he partnered with SO gas stations. And SO was an incredible player in the success of the green book because they had hired two black marketing executives who were featured in the book in my book um and victor they knew about the green book and victor knew about them and they partnered to um basically make sure that every so gas station had a green book so you could get it there there were a couple of uh, department stores that would carry the green book in new york um and other places but then once it became so popular within these black businesses, they would always have copies. So if you go to the Dunbar in Los Angeles, they'd have extra copies there for folks. Um, you know, it was in beauty salons and uh, a lot of, um, you know, porters, you know, who were, um, would also pass out the Chicago Defender on the train. You know, some of them had green books too. So it really got around. 
There's a, we have on the screen now for everyone, an image nice. of the SO service station. I was really enlightened to, to read that. I was quite impressed with the um, inclusive approach to business that SO yeah. uh, uh, demonstrated. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, it was unprecedented uh, because a lot of uh, gas stations at that time um, openly refused to serve black folks, or if they did, finally let you get gas they wouldn't let you use facilities um so it was very dehumanizing and it was a it again that was a risk and there were garages um and a lot of auto mechanics in, in the green book um actually the first edition the second edition 1937 edition that's the first edition we have actually have access to no one has seen the 1936 edition but the 1937 edition is mostly auto companies out of Harlem. So it was, you know, it, the car was very important and making sure it was in working order was, you know, critical. Um, but Esso gas stations is ExxonMobil today. Um, and ExxonMobil is actually sponsoring the exhibition I have with the Smithsonian. So they're still, you know, they're doing the right thing in this regard. Um, but yeah, they went above and beyond. And we think part of the reason why Esso was so unique I mean, they hired black chemists. They had black people in every state. They black folks, men, franchised um, their own gas station. So they didn't just work at the station. They owned, you know, they owned a franchise, um, part of the uh, the business. So it was a very innovative and unprecedented thing for a, a company as big as ExxonMobil to do. And we think the reason that this happened is because. Um, Rockefeller, who owned Esso, was a was married to Laura Spellman, and she was a white woman, um, but she was raised in a house on the um, Underground Railroad, and her family, you know, they were huge um, philanthropists and abolitionists, and I think she was Rockefeller's conscience. Mm -hmm. Um, and she, you know, he, Spelman college is named after her. Mm -hmm. Um, so she is a big name in terms of black civil rights. And I don't think you could be married to her and not be thinking about what are you doing for black folks here? Mm -hmm. Because this is, you know, serious and the car was very serious. And so that's, you know, no, we don't know for sure, but that's what a lot of me and other historians assume, um, was the case. And you brought in the um, fact that I was, I was pleased to learn uh, about the Marcellus family. We know that name from yes. jazz, but their yes. uh, grandfather was the uh, owner of a station mm -hmm. and uh, a hotel. Um, I want to just briefly uh, bring up before I break, take it back to you, Ronnie, uh, the yeah. point you just made about what it was like to travel for black people um, and, and the idea that someone wouldn't sell you gas. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Again, it, it does two things. It talks about the way that uh, it well, it really not talks about it. It proves it's a fact of life that for us to recall helps us to illustrate the the the, the cool nature of segregation and the way that it dehumanized uh, mm -hmm. black families. But it also calls up the need again for something like the Green Book, which is really the mantra, right? avoid embarrassment, mm -hmm. <laughs> avoid, you know, having uh, these negative or uh, racialized experiences if you are empowered, uh, you and your family um, with this book. The the practice of the fried chicken and the pound cake, uh, preparing for travel, uh, making sure I read in your book, Ms. Taylor, having sheets so in case you couldn't use the restroom, women and you know, I don't know if any of the ladies here tried to use <laughs> facilities without facilities. It is a very delicate uh, measure. But you think about like that was a common common experience. It's um, it really is something to contemplate. And you, you do a, a really brilliant job of, yes. of bringing that to the fore uh, in your book. Thank you. Yeah, no, I have a just a quick um, I interviewed a man uh, who was Herbert Riley. He passed. Um, and I interviewed him actually after I had written the book, but he tells a story. Um, and his interview is actually, I have, uh, I interviewed black business owners who are green book business owners. And those interviews are archived at the Library of Congress. So people can just, if they type Library of Congress, green book and Taylor, it should come up. But you can, you know, Leah Chase and other people, she ran 
uh, Dookie Chase's restaurant in New Orleans. So all of those interviews are there, but Herbert talks about um, women in his family and how they how faithful they were to Esso. Because he said, if we found an Esso station, we knew we were all right. Mm -hmm. But not only did they have, you know, the sheets to protect, you know, cause it was like, well, yeah, for a man, you know, we could relieve ourselves in a field and, you know, keep moving. Um, but what they would have to do as kids, he didn't even know this, but they were, you know, he was young and they'd have the boys go run out into the field to scare away the snakes so that women could go there to use the bathroom. And he said, they made it a game. The parents thought, you know, just go out there and run around, <laughs> you know, but they didn't know that's what they were doing um, to scare away the snakes so that the women could use the bathroom. And Herbert talks about that knowing now as a man, you know, how yet yeah, dehumanizing and just um, horrible, you know, that that's what they had to do. Wonderful. <clears throat> I had to put on my glasses now, so I'm gonna, <laughs> so I can see the questions. I love I'm your glasses. Give... I wish I had some like that. <laughs> they are fly. You. Uh -huh. you all, you all, are, all are vision tonight. I know we're supposed to be focusing on the book. You look great tonight, I just wanna say. Okay. You know, it's great. we had some sites for haberdasheries and all that other stuff, so. That's what we're doing, right? We're trying, to, we're trying to keep business alive. <laughs> okay. Okay. We have someone from Morocco saying hello. So, okay. So from Paula Quinsonberry, she says, can you expand upon the 1951 issue entitled the Railroad Edition? Well, yeah, there was, uh, there were two actual, there were uh, two editions. Um, the 1950 edition actually had a big train on the front. And then the 1951 had the Railroad Edition. Um, and because again, you know, different types of travel, the first say 15 years of the green book, it focused a lot on the car and there's even an airline edition that comes later. So this was the railroad um, edition and, and, you know, the reporters, there's a big article in there about, um, train travel at that time. I write about it in my book and it's actually, Kind of perplexing because Victor Green, I, he he had access to this article that to me was kind of misrepresenting what <laughs> black train travel really was for folks, especially in the South. However, right. Victor Green was, you know, from Harlem, he was from the North, and maybe if you did take a train from Harlem, you know, from New York to Philadelphia or even to the West, as long as you didn't cross Mason Dixon line, um, you know, you would have a different experience. But folks who, in my book, I, you know, Victor Green doesn't get into this in his railroad edition, but in my book, you know, I talk about the folks who were traveling, who were leaving the South and how different, you know, if you were sitting on a train, there were, your clothes were covered in soot because you had to sit behind the caboose you didn't have the same food options or the same seating options, or the comfort that white folks traveled in. Um, or if you could start out in the North, once you got to the South, you had to move to your appropriate car. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that. but his railroad edition literally just has an article um, featuring it. And if you would like to see it, um, you can, the Schomburg was where I had my fellowship, which, there, there would be no book. There would be no Overground Railroad without the Schomburg. Um, you just get that straight because they digitized what twenty four editions, Makiba. I think so. Uh, yeah, um, I think when I got in there, they digitized twenty three, but I think they've done it one more since I since I left. But before, when twenty thirteen, there were only two PDFs of the Green Book floating around. Um, no one knew about all the others. Uh, and it was a Schomburg who had the largest collection. And once they digitized it, it was a game changer. But when I got to do my fellowship there was when I got to really dig in to the Green Book. But now if you Google Green Book NYPL for New York Public Library, all of them will come up and you can flip through them so we and see that railroad guide. 
we posted that in the chat. So, so oh, good. Yeah. Sorry, I don't. I try and not right to now, and it's twenty three. Um, in that's in the digital space. So I'm not sure if they've not loaded the the other one up. Um, but well, I think there's a vacation guide that's not actually a year guide okay. that they have there, and then the the last edition, sixty six, sixty seven. I don't think they had rights, or maybe they did get the rights to um to post that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Candace, I want to talk a little bit about um, like <coughs> joy and pleasure, and I think you do a really great job in chapter um, chapters about vacations and uh, music venues. It's really fun. I, I think a lot of times we 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 sometimes forget that even in all of the terror and the trauma that we survive, we still find joy um, and make those those spaces for ourselves. Um, and so those chapters are really fun to read. And one one part that I, I want to talk about because um, the one on one, the Daisy. Oh chapter. yeah. So it's really like salacious in this story. And I was like, it actually was featured in the 1938. Because I'm thinking like all of these businesses are like respectable businesses. <laughs> and so when you tell the story about the the sex club. I'm like, whoa, wow, it's great. Like, what? So can you can you talk? Because it's like this is pushing also a little bit against these politics of respectability. And the book had a little bit of something for everybody. Yeah, no, so it did. It was I I believe I I I think I could say it was the only sex club in the green book. Um, but yes, it was a sex club, it was in Harlem. It was run by a woman named Hazel Valentine. Um, she was a chorus dancer, but she there were a lot of <clears throat> prostitutes who worked there, and it was an integrated sex club. People were having sex, like, and it was like a, a kind of a um, one of those uh, long uh, hallways with the rooms off to the side. But then there was a space where people performed, and it, but it was a club too. It was a very established nightclub. Count Basie, Billie Holiday, Fats Waller, they were all regulars. Um, Fats Waller wrote a song called Valentine's Stomp. Count Basie wrote a song based on it. I mean, it was very, it was notorious, but it was very popular. And, um, you know, and I did write a, another small story with the National Trust. So if you Google 101 Taylor, you can read a little bit more about it. But it was incredible, um, an incredible find. And when I was at the Schaumburg, I dug and dug and I was like, please, if I can find any more. There was a six foot four tall drag queen named Clarence. Um, and it's with a Z at the end of his name, <laughs> who was fabulous and performed. And, you know, Hazel, Val I mean, there's stuff in the, I didn't put it in the book, Hazel Valentine shot her husband, <laughs> um, shot him in the back. He lived. <laughs> And then he defended her on the stand and said, I oh, don't wow. know who shot me. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> she was not playing, but she was a major chorus girl. She danced with Josephine Baker and she was all throughout Europe. And, you know, these were people knew her and um, they were just very liberated, you know, and they were having nice. a good time. My goodness. Yeah, and that's as the green book turns, that's, uh, yes. that's, that's interesting. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, it was fun to write. I guess, well, can I, uh, so I wanted to say, can you speak on the rise of the black leisure class and how the automobile facilitated the ascent on that? Yeah, um, yeah the, basically, you know, those chapters, like Makiba said, I mean, it really, it was hard to write this book and there were so many times when I have to push away from my desk and just in tears and just be like, I can't, I can't, exactly. if I see another life lunching photo, like I just, exactly. you know, it was just heartbreaking. Um, and there were, you know, and I print this, um, the uh, Chicago um, paper, uh, I think it was published in 1925 that literally says, you know, to black folks, like you're an irritating presence when you go to a beach or any kind of recreational place and whether or not that's right we you know it's best if you just stay away mm -hmm. from those places I mean it just says outright in the paper you know mm -hmm. just don't go to beaches because you know there were so many different um 
dramas that happened. They, some Myrtle Beach would have a rope, an orange rope, dividing, you know, the place where black folks could swim yes. and couldn't. Um, so again, it was so liberating that the Green Book had golf courses, they had beaches, they had all of these, um, there was Idlewild that was just this black Mecca of just beautiful people, you know, black folks hanging out on the beach and they had summer homes and um, there was a dude ranch um, yeah. in the Green Book and that was one of my favorite finds. Yes. Uh, it was in the Mojave Desert. It had been, oh my God, I mean, Pearl Bailey bought it and later in the in the late 50s, but it had been run by the Murrays from the 30s and um, Joe Lewis and his entourage would show up there. And it was a place where black and white kids swam together. It was first place in that part of the country where they did, um, but it was all black um, cowboy culture. And um, it was just fabulous. And to see the photographs and find um, this level of yeah, interaction um, and play and community and fun. And um, it, it really, I mean, I needed it because it was just too much exactly. hard stuff. But there were, and I think that's the bottom line is what I keep learning, whether it's the Tulsa Race Massacre, you know, um, when you look at the Greenwood District and all the prosperity that was there, it's like until if, if if white folks had just left us alone, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we had mm -hmm. great food, music, fun. We had stuff going on, you know? And, right. And and things that they wanted to take part of as well, you know? I mean, and white people were trying to integrate into these black businesses that were green book sites, whether it was New Orleans or places where it was illegal. And the green book sites were being shut down because white people could stop coming because the music was so good or the food was so good. Mm -hmm. And um, and yet the irony is, right, that um, despite all of, you know, what we were able to do, being shut out, being marginalized, not right. having enough, you know, access to money or whatever, if we had our own businesses and we supported our own businesses, we were fine. Yes, we were yes, fine. yes. And that's Beautiful. proof, the Green Book is proof of that. Yes. All right, Ronnie, we, we do have another wanna... question. Yeah. Yeah, there's a question. There's a question from John Camp. And uh, the question is the effects of the building of the interstate highway system on Black communities have been well documented. How, if at all, did the interstate highway system af affect Black mobility for better or for worse? Yes, and that's a great question. And there's a chapter dedicated to that issue in the book um, because it was, again, a double-edged sword, um, a lot of times it gave black folks access to not have to go through all the small towns and all the stop signs and all the sundown towns, like mm -hmm. you could bypass those with a freeway system. And yet that those freeways through eminent domain destroyed our communities. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as I go back and, you know, document these sites, um, I'll see where there were once 20, uh, 20 green book sites and it's, replaced by a freeway now. And they literally just bulldozed them down and just, you know, it was, they didn't do that in, in the white community communities. They didn't displace folks or take their businesses and, and demolish them. And um, it was heartbreaking and it was horrifying and it happened um, throughout the country. And we still see scars of that today. Yes, yes mm -hmm. absolutely. And, um, and thank you for that. Uh, we have in the comment, Ramona LaRoche is reminding us of um, how African-Americans dealt with that res racism at the beach that she says in Myrtle Beach, they created Atlantic Beach um, here in Florida. Um, we had uh, American Beach that was mm -hmm. purchased and developed by Abraham Lincoln Lewis. He was uh, a huge uh, philanthropist and, and donor to the Florida Memorial when it was located in uh, Jacksonville and St. Augustine. So we, we remember him fondly. And then Mary McLeod Bethune, another uh, really important figure in Florida history, founded Bethune Beach as a place of lab uh, leisure for black folks. Uh, here in South Florida, we had Virginia Key Beach, which is still being preserved and um, still open, uh, which leads me to the pivot. We wanted to, uh, as we uh, wrap up our, our last few moments with you, Ms. Taylor, really glad to have you um, ask you another question that will bring you here uh, on the ground. 
uh, in South Florida, in Florida generally. Uh, but as I do this, I want to invite any of our viewers to please post your questions in the chat, whether in on YouTube or Facebook, um, and we'll try to get to them in the time that we have remaining. But yes, Ms. Taylor, um, could you talk about any uh, Florida sites that you were able to include uh, in your yeah. book, Overground Railroad? Yeah, you know, Florida was um, an interesting state because obviously the Hampton House is the most famous um, and maybe the one most people have heard about. Uh, it was, gosh, it was owned by actually the Mankiewicz family. It was owned by a Jewish family, um, but it was a completely uh, incredibly important civil rights place um, for King, apparently the story goes, he practices, I have a dream speech there. It was a place where Malcolm X um, proselytized uh, Cassius Clay. He walked in as Cassius Clay, left as Muhammad Ali. Um, there were, you know, so many beautiful images of King just kind of hanging out in the pool, um, very relaxed. There was a maitre d' with gold lame, you know, suit on, and you had to be dressed. And yes, uh, thank you for showing the photograph. Um, it was the creme de la creme of black, you know, intelligentsia and black social life and folks were, um, you know, looked their best. And it was essentially serving a purpose because Miami Beach, where a lot of the performers would, black performers perform on Miami Beach, it couldn't stay in Miami Beach. So they could stay in the Hampton House, um, which I believe is a Brownsville district. Is that what it's called? Yes. Um, it's been yes. a while. Yeah. So. The irony is, though, when I went to interview, um, and also Enid Pinkney, she's an incredible woman. She's, uh, I think, was in her 70s when she started preservation mm. efforts to bring the Hampton House back because it had been abandoned. Um, there yes. were trees growing into the, you know, swimming pool. Again, even though all this incredible civil rights history happened there, it was basically being completely um, abandoned and forgotten and not valued. And so thankfully, um, Ms. Pinckney's efforts, um, they've undergone a nearly $10 million renovation and it is just a stunning uh, mid-century building and they brought it back to just exactly what it used to look like. Um, so that's one of the most impressive and successful preservation stories of all the green book sites I've been following. So kudos to Florida, South Florida for that, because I'm working with um, uh, the, own, the new owner of the Dew Drop um, in New Orleans. And I've seen Charlie, uh, Charlie's place, you know, they're trying to bring that back to life in, um, in Myrtle Beach. And there's another one, Clifton's um, in LA mm -hmm. that they have done like a $9 million renovation, but those are so few and far between and, oh, great. And these are um, iconic places where really important things happened historically. And yet, you know, it's hard to get the cities to really, you know, put the money behind um, bringing them back to life. So, yeah, it's and there were other there are plenty other places in uh, but that, you know, the there was the Wells built in Orlando, but that's not really southern Florida. There's a Hotel Grisham, I think, in Pompado Beach. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but there's only a handful. There were about just under a hundred green book sites in Florida, maybe a little more, but um, there were only really a handful that, that are still around. And I've estimated that less than 5% of these sites are still operating out of the 10,000 sites I've documented. So that's about right, um, you know, in terms of, yeah, uh, what we have left, which is why we have to save them. Yeah, we. Um, I just happened to be back at the Hampton House um, a few mm -hmm. nights ago for a program, and it is a stunning, stunning space. Um, and you know, not being used for its original purpose, but you just okay. you still get a sense of the beauty and vibrancy of the architecture. Shout out to Jackie Collier and Imani Warren, some of our friends at the historic Hampton House. You heard it here. One of the best preserved. Uh, of uh, uh, sites on the Green Book Tours right here in South Florida. So if you're living in the region and you haven't been down, you need to make your way over to the historic Hampton House and take in some of, of that really important history. Well, we are um, closing down on, on time, but I wanted to um, 
turn it to you, uh, Ms. Taylor, to uh, give us some concluding thoughts, what you'd love for your audience to know, um, maybe for those who have not yet read, uh, picked up your book, Overground Railroad, what, what thoughts would you uh, like to leave them with uh, this evening? Well, first I'd like to say thank you again for having me and this has been really lovely and I appreciate the robust and conversation with all of the uh, interesting questions and I really appreciate that everybody did such a nice, a close reading of the material, thank you. Um, and I think that basically my biggest takeaway right now with the reason when I wrote this book, what I gave to the publisher as my, as my proposal was a very different book than the one that I ended up writing. And it, was, it wasn't until after I really went to places um, throughout the country and I saw the conditions that these neighborhoods were in where these green book sites were clustered that I realized um, this is not just a historic travel guide. This did not happen in a vacuum. This is not a historic time capsule that we can look back and say, oh, it's too bad that we needed that then. You know, clearly things are um, different now. Some things are better, some things are not. But the reason why my book is um, laid out uh, chronologically over each decade, where we see these this pendulum of justice that would swing forward and then it would swing back and we would make progress and then we would fall back. So that, you know, when Trump was elected, me and Ron, you know, were in the car, we're like, yeah, we're not surprised, you know, because that's the backswing after Obama. Um, but I just want folks, when they read the book, and they think about this material to see the layers of history that are right in front of us that we keep repeating a lot of these same things. When you talk about, you know, urban renewal and say, oh, it was horrible that they decimated those communities, but they called it progress at the time. And gentrification mm -hmm. is a parallel to that today. They call it progress and yet yes. it's decimating our communities. And so if we don't want to be scratching our heads in another hundred years, you know, the next generation saying, oh, my God, how did how is how are we still dealing with this? Why? And, you know, after all this time, do we still have these problems with race? Um, we keep cycling through the same stuff. And yes. so the book really shows that hopefully in a way that is compelling. But it also ends with us, you know, looking at mass incarceration as the civil rights crisis of our time. And regardless of all the red herrings that we kind of get, you know, hung up on and black Twitter or whatever, and these, pro you know, there are two, there are nearly a third of our young black men and women are sitting in jail and it is wrong. And to, so to me, that was a big, um, and if you read the end of my book, you know, you'll see that I have a what you can do section that really addresses this because that's what keeps me up at night. That's what hurts my heart. Um, I think we've done something that, is as difficult for us to untangle as slavery was um, at the time of trying to divest economic incentive and progress and um, with race, you know, cause that's why they, they couldn't say, well, there's just too much economic power. So if we don't have slaves, the whole country is gonna fall apart. And that's essentially what we've done with the prison industrial complex. And so to untangle that is gonna be equally um, devastating if we can even do it. And so of course, Michelle Alexander um, is the premier who's, you know, authority on that subject. But, um, but that to me is, I hope it just makes you think about seeing parallels where we keep making the similar mistakes today and use the guide, use the book as a guide to um, find innovative and simple solutions to stop, you know, repeating these horrific um, processes. I think um, in your book, I think in your book, you have said history doesn't repeat itself; humans do. Right. I like that. There you go. That's the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. <laughs> very, very well put. And I, I would agree with you, Ms. Taylor. It is absolutely compelling. Um, it ranges uh, all of the emotions as we've kind of even talked through here tonight 
of the human experience. It beautifully captures the striving of the black experience here in America, trying to make a way out of no way, even down the highway. Um, yes. And um, <laughs> lots and lots of food for thought. I I, um, I I love Kwanzaa, I love the principles of Kwanzaa. Uh, Kuji Chagalia, the idea of self-determination is really important. And, and also um, uh, an African principle from the Akan people of Sankofa. Uh, the only way that we can move forward is if we look back. And so you in this book, Overground Railroad, have given us just a beautiful glimpse back at ourselves and a very, very powerful piece of history. And, and for that, on behalf of our audience, I would just really like to thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us yes. today. Thank, thank, you. Well. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. I beautiful. So appreciate it. All right. Well, with that, we are going to draw our discussion to a close, but I want to pivot very quickly uh, to my sister in the struggle, uh, McKeep Foster, who's going to talk to us a little bit more about what else you can expect during the South Florida Book Fair. Makiba. So this was a fabulous installment of our Social Justice Common Read, but also a wonderful collaboration with the South Florida Book Festival. This was our opening night for the book festival. And so Candace uh, ended talking about mass incarceration. One of the authors um, that we are bringing, and he actually will be here in, in the present, in the physical sense. Um, it will be an outdoor event with his large book bus, Desmond Mead. And so talking about mm -hmm. um, mass incarceration and his work to help um, the rights of returning citizens mm -hmm. and what happens when you are released, how do you navigate a system that still wants to deny you every bit of your humanity, uh, including voting rights. So, <coughs> And so the, uh, the rest of the book festival starts tomorrow on Friday evening at 6 p.m. with our Eat, Drink, Read. So we'll have a cookbook chef. He'll be cooking up some food, Chef Irie, as well as our uh, flip and sip. We'll get a cocktail uh, made especially for our South Florida Book Festival. And then on Saturday, we have some wonderful authors that's representing the diaspora. This is quite international. We have folks from South Africa, London, Barbados. They are from everywhere, but they are Black people representing and spreading knowledge and writing and doing all the creative things that we just talked about with the Black folks that, that did the Green Book. So I hope you all can join us. I will definitely be there. <laughs> I will definitely be there. I'm traveling. I picked the worst weekend to travel. But uh, we have a bit of a... Part of it's virtual, so you can, you can tune in. Okay, well, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try that. Right. Um, I understand from production we have a video to um, give a little bit of a teaser for the book fair. So we'll go ahead and, and put that on. Okay. There you have it, folks. You got a, a first glimpse at what to expect. Like, I'm big mad. Um, eating books, eating, I'm sorry, reading books and, and sipping and eating. It's all my favorite things. All I my know. Favorite things. It looks like a beautiful <laughs> event, Makiba. Something for everyone, uh, even the yes. kids. So I hope uh, I want to encourage everyone. Since I can't be there myself, please, please go support this year, this event. Um, it's one of my mm -hmm. favorite places in South Florida, the African American Research Library, and Makiba mm -hmm. and her crew have put together a fantastic uh, event. So please go enjoy. Um, I want to share some exciting news for the uh, South, for the 
so Social Justice Institute at Florida Memorial University. Uh, we are very excited to announce that this October, October 22nd and 23rd, we will be having our inaugural Social Justice Conference on campus in person. We're calling it Building a Different World, Reimagining the Future. Um, we want to engage the students on our campus and in the community, uh, people in the community uh, in this conversation around the work that we need to do to build the future that we want for ourselves in South Florida and the rest of the world. Our featured speaker will be Nse Ufat with the New Georgia Project. Uh, if you don't know her name, you should. She's been on MSNBC. Uh, and the New Florida jo New Georgia Project was actually founded by Stacey Abrams, uh, a name that many of us do know. And so it's going to be a really important conversation about what they were able to accomplish in Georgia. We want to bring some of that same energy here to South Florida. Uh, there will be something for everyone. We'll have a step show. We have Octavia Yearwood, who's going to be doing uh, her libations uh, live art project. Papa Keith and his crew are going to be doing a pop up on that Saturday. You saw Valencia Gunder. She's going to be a part. We're hoping to get Desmond Mead and the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition out. But please mark your calendars, uh, visit Eventbrite and the FMU SJI Social Justice Institute link to register. We're going to be conducting the registrations through Eventbrite. So I wanted to share that with our audience tonight. Uh, please be on the lookout for more information. If you haven't already, please follow us on social media, FMU SJI, uh, along with the South Florida People of Color and the African American Research Library for more programming that will enlighten you, inform you, and continue to move uh, the needle towards inclusion and create social justice in our community. So with that, um, Ronnie, Makiba. I just, I just want to say thank everyone. And I'm, I'm just an honor to be in community with everyone and, and especially Miss Taylor. So I really appreciate mm -hmm. being in this space with you. So thank you. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you everyone for being here. Yes, yes. Thank yes. you. Yeah, and I, I, just, I just want to say that I, 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 when Candace was at the Schomburg, I was there too. So. Yes, she was. I, I love you. you. Were, she is a wonderful person in person. Yes, we got to hang out. I miss you. I miss you too. Oh. I'm jealous. <laughs> wonderful person. <laughs> right. And we have, and then to, to a confession, we have Makiba to thank for for putting your book on our radar. So yes. I, her before. I want to I want to yeah. thank her publicly for, for for recommending this book. And I want to I want to invite everyone to this was our third installment. Um, this December is when. We're we're targeting to do um, our, our uh, fourth installment. We were uh, committed to three of these a year, uh, but please watch our social media spaces and our event right for news on the next uh, selection for the South Florida Social Justice Common Read. I want to thank our production team, yes. uh, Tatachi Curtis, it's a Tatachi Egwu and Curtis Brooks uh, of We Are Live. They always make us look so yes. good, even though it can be a struggle some nights. Uh, we really appreciate <laughs> them and what they do for us. Fantastic work again. And to all of you out there, thank you for being with us. Please tell a friend. The recordings will be available uh, on the social media for SJI as well as Florida, as Florida Memorial University. But with that, keep reading, keep working. There's so much to do and we need everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Awesome. Are, are we off? Uh, no, Ronnie, the line, the, it still says live.